They were three superstars living on a prayer without an ounce of R-E-S-P-E-C-T. In the end, it didn't even matter as those same superstars would come together and would usher in the winds of change. You will get a band. Like, great! Who is it? Jinder and Drew. While others were capturing the company's top honors, Heath Slater, Drew McIntyre, and Jinder Mahal air guitared their way into the hearts and minds of the WWE Universe in their mission to rock and roll all night and party every day. So the public wants to know what instruments we all play? We play them all, people! For the next two years, the three-man band would ride the crazy train known as the mid-card. They would find a kind of magic to thrive under pressure time after time. When 3MB appeared on your screen, they'd rock you like a hurricane. The only thing you need to remember is 3MB. But there was no endless love for the group as they would find themselves with broken dreams. And when it came to firings, two out of three ain't bad. Did you forget to call me or something? Now on Wrestling With Regret, we take a closer look at 3MB's journey through the fire and flames and find out what happened when it came crashing down and hurt inside. Plus, how the lads are doing today. This is Three Man Band, Behind the Gimmick. Despacito. Before we get into the formation of 3MB, you have to start with the individual pieces, beginning with Drew McIntyre, the first man of the group to debut for WWE all the way back in August of 2009. Now, the guy that you saw beat Brock Lesnar for the championship at the strangest WrestleMania of all time, well, that elevated form of McIntyre is the culmination of a long journey that began with a very public declaration. Well, it reminds me a lot of me, quite frankly. A future world heavyweight champion. Here is Drew. McIntyre! That's right, the young McIntyre got a rare public stamp of approval from Mr. McMahon himself. No pressure or anything. Now billed as a future world champion, he would soon become known as the Chosen One. Sorry, but until he begins bopping people on the head with guitars, there's only room for one Chosen One in my life. Drew went on to have a terrific unbeaten streak on SmackDown. That, combined with very obvious preferential treatment on air from Vinnie Mac, helped bring him a five-month Intercontinental title reign, a run with Cody Rhodes as tag champs, a Money in the Bank match, and more. But by the end of 2010, Drew's career was suddenly in a free fall. That August, police were called to the scene of a domestic disturbance in an L.A. hotel room where Drew was with his then-wife, Tiffany Terrell. Tiffany was the only one arrested that night, but would eventually be cleared of all charges. Drew told the press that it was all a misunderstanding, but that incident seemed to leave a bad taste in Vince's mouth, sending McIntyre on the road to Jobsville for more than a year. Now, to be clear, it's worth pointing out that the link between Drew's killed push and the alleged altercation with his wife was never made fully confirmed. He had other things working against him at the time as well. For example, the sudden arrival of the Nexus meant a lot less screen time for some guys, not to mention there were rumors that he was gaining a bad reputation backstage. Still, considering how others have been punished for other, even lesser ordeals over the years, I have to believe that the incident in Los Angeles played a big role in McIntyre being de-pushed as hard as he was. Speaking of the Nexus, that's where we find our next band member, the one-man rock band, Keith Slater. Debuting on TV as part of that legendary first season of the original NXT, he and the rest of his fellow castmates waged war on WWE in the summer of 2010. I've already covered the Nexus in great detail on this channel, but if you want a refresher, just smash your face into a wall while blasting John Cena's theme on loop, because that's pretty much how it went. When the Nexus underwent new management with CM Punk, Slater left the group and formed the core with Justin Gabriel, Wade Barrett, and Ezekiel Jackson. It didn't go quite well for them either. After the breakup of Not Nexus, Heath would actually revive the Legend Killer gimmick. I'm sorry, the words in that one were switched around a bit. Let me say it again. His gimmick was he was killed by legends. Back on TV in the summer of 2012 after serving his first wellness suspension, Heath would find himself getting crushed by legends of all shapes and sizes for weeks. From Vader, to Roddy Piper, to the APA, to Psycho Sid, to Lita, Slater was beaten by a veritable who's who, many of whom whom hadn't wrestled full time since the Reagan administration. Nice for Heath to be on TV, sure, but didn't do a lot for the man's image. But to be fair, maybe Heath wouldn't have got beat up by so many legends if he didn't keep setting them up for it. I am not a clown. Slater, Tom, baby, Slater, Tom, Tom, oh, oh, man. Ah, rule the world. Oh, wait just a minute. Finally, hailing from the deepest, darkest part of India, known as Calgary, Alberta, Canada, Jinder Mahal was brought into WWE in 2011 and was instantly paired up with his fellow kayfabe countryman, the Great Khali. 
Ah yes, managing the great Kali. Puts him in a real exclusive club of guys. Huh, I wonder what it is that makes all these guys so qualified for the job. Hmm. A short-lived association turned into an even shorter rivalry between the two, and before long, Jinder found himself doing the lower mid-card shuffle with guys like Ryback, Yoshitatsu, Ted DiBiase, and others. His greatest success during this time actually came in the early days of the newly rebranded NXT, challenging Seth Rollins to the NXT Championship in December of 2012, though he would come up short. All three men found themselves stagnating in WWE, manning their boats without rudders, but that would all soon change with an idea, a rockin', rollin' idea. In the fall of 2012, Slater made a pitch to WWE Creative. Since he'd been going by the one-man rock band for so long, why not build an actual band of men around him? Having no other ideas for the man John Cena once referred to on live TV as Wendy, the company gave it the okay, pairing Slater with two other members of the roster who also had nothing else to do. You know how fans will sometimes do some fantasy booking and they'll see some guys in the lower mid car not doing anything and they'll say, well, just put them in a stable and it'll sort itself out. Well, this group shows the pros and the cons of that mentality. The three-man band officially started touring on the September 21st edition of SmackDown, as Drew and Jinder would interfere on Heath's behalf in a match against Brodus Clay, a vicious beatdown that I'm sure had the Funkasaurus reaching out to a specific family member for solace. The stage was set and the band was playing, but not everybody was buying it, least of all the principal characters. It, to me, it sounded like a, a, a bad joke. You know, Scotsman, Indian, and a redneck yeah. walks into a bar. <laughs> Recent history has shown us when you're part of a stable in WWE, you're either a God-level championship contender, someone who's just filling the void and helping enhance other wrestlers, or you're a comedic act never taken seriously. And based on what we see here in this group, what end of the spectrum do you think they're going to be on? At first, these three men simply refer to themselves as The Band. If that sounds familiar to you, no, I mean in wrestling, that was the same name as the NWO light stable that lingered in TNA two years earlier. Given the state of guys like Scott Hall, Sean Waltman, and Bubba the Love Sponge at the time, I think it was a smart move for Heath and company to try and distance themselves from that exact name. Soon our heroes would learn to count, and thus the three-man band, or 3MB, was formed. After a beatdown on Zack Ryder in Nashville, the group wanted to celebrate in Music City with a performance of their own. This had become one of the running gags with the group, as they would either be asked to perform and refuse, or be cut off as their performances began. Are you ready? A one, a two, a one, two, three, four! Gentlemen. Now we all joked that 3MB were a group of jobbers who just jobbed their damn jobs off, but that wasn't exactly the case at the beginning. Across Raw, SmackDown, Superstars, and Saturday Morning Slam, the group went a lot more often than they lost in those early days, not just in tag action, but in singles matches too, against guys like the Usos and Team Cobro. Uh, that was actually a thing, by the way. Uh, Santina Morella and Zack Ryder, they were a team briefly called Team Cobro. Yeah, but the good vibes were short-lived and the times they were a change in fast. At TLC in December of the same year, they lost a six-man tag team match to The Miz, Alberto Del Rio, and their mystery partner, The Brooklyn Brawler. Now that match may sound like the result of universe mode in a three-day Takis bender, and believe me, I was also shocked to read the result, but there was actually a storyline reason for the match taking place. The band had cut off a Miz TV earlier in the show to bring about the match, and the show took place in Brooklyn just to find the brawler's appearance. It all sounds horribly random, but that was the early 2010s in a nutshell, really. At least it got over. Give it up for the Brooklyn Brawler! Brooklyn Brawler! What? <laughs> oh my! The lads would even challenge for the tag team titles on Raw, but that's only because it was champion's choice and they made the mistake of upsetting Team Hell No at precisely the wrong moment. The slippery slope continued for our boys. Not only were the losses beginning to pile up, they were also being overlooked by the shiny new trio toys. Within months after 3MB's debut, The Shield, The Wyatt Family, and The New Day would all form in WWE. Now in terms of lasting impact and presence on the card, which of these things is not like the other? Still, you have to hand it to those guys. 3MB came along before any of the other groups did. So, in a way, 3MB were trendsetters. Trendsetters, man. <laughs> we started it. See? 
3 and B's 2013 began with a shock victory, though it shouldn't be too shocking considering it was a 3-on-1 over-the-top battle against Sheamus. Don't worry though, he get his heat back within seconds. The losses kept coming for months on end, often losing to teams of the primetime players, the Shield, and the Usos. But at least during this time, one of the members created one of the most over-finishers in the modern day completely by accident. And all three men, wow. except for uh, Whoa. Say two men. And yep, as the story goes, the Claymore debuted as a botch, what was meant to be a big boot proof difficult in tight leather pants, so the move turned into a flying kick. The blooper gave Drew a new finisher and a mild concussion. The gang saw more losses and more hardship as 2013 went on. Region-specific rebrandings like the Union Jacks and the Rhinestone Cowboys only hurt their reputation along with each loss, but it was their lengthy feud with Los Matadores and El Torito that would be the group's high point. In the first months of 2014, the two teams waged a war. Well, less of a war and more of a totally one-sided beatdown as 3MB recorded few, if any, wins during this time. Then in April, 3MB apparently realized the key to success would be to get their own lovable mascot. Thus, Hornswoggle was added to the mix. The group's third and a half member would take on El Torito at the Extreme Rules kickoff show in the first and only Wii LC match. And they really went all out for this one, folks. Little wrestlers, little weapons, a little ring announcer, even a pint-sized announced team at ringside. It's like Raw, they're not calling the I'm looking for something. <laughs> The whole thing sounds corny and kind of exploitive, but in all honesty, this match rules. It's a perfect example of a comedy match done well, performed in front of an audience who were fully in on the joke. 3 and B are pivotal players in this thing as they bump their asses off as the match goes on, including Slater going through several mini tables and Jinder getting totally wrecked on whatever ungodly pile of ladders and tables this thing was. The match saw Torito go over, but in the end, the fans won here as they were into this thing the entire way through. Dave Meltzer even gave it three stars, but I I have to assume that in keeping with the theme, he scaled the top rating back to 2.5, making this the Okada Omega of little person matches. Unfortunately, there would be no encore of 3MB's greatest performance. Hornswoggle would lose his hair in a rematch to El Torito at Payback. Then Drew McIntyre and Jinder Mahal were released from the company on June 12, 2014, leaving Heath a one-man rock band once again. Waiting, waiting, waiting to where I got antsy and I called Carano. And I was like, Mark, did you forget to call me or something? You know, like, what's going on here? We've seen the rise, we've seen the fall. Now, all these years later, how have the boys from 3MB bounced back? As McIntyre and Mahal went back to work in the independent scene, Slater plugged along as one of the company's longest tenured enhancement talents. From teaming with Titus O'Neil for a bit to being part of the social outcasts, Slater would keep on losing matches, though he did score a big role in the Marine 5 as one of the main antagonists. Somewhere in an alternate timeline, the Miz Taraj, and therefore the B Team, is a trio. His biggest career high since the debut of the Nexus came in 2016. Going undrafted by either Raw or SmackDown, Slater fought for employment because he, as he famously put it, had kids. He would eventually be paired up with the veteran Rhino in a series of must-win matches, ultimately becoming the first SmackDown Tag Team Champions in one of the best storylines the company had all year. The team would stay together until 2019 when Rhino was released. After a short run as a reluctant referee under general manager Baron Corbin, Slater would spend months under the radar until sadly getting his release just one week before this video came out. One of the many fired as a cost-cutting measure as the coronavirus outbreak has ravaged the economy. Following his release, Ginger Mahal kept himself busy working for various independent shows in Puerto Rico, Canada, India, Qatar, and Wynwood, Oklahoma, apparently. Along the way, Mahal quit drinking and got his body in immaculate shape, leading to his return to WWE in July of 2016. Ironically, Mahal re-earned his spot in the Raw roster by beating his former partner, Heath Slater, in a match. My elation was dashed so quickly. I thought 2MB was going to take over Raw. Raw. The next several months seemed like familiar territory for Mahal, saddled with a weak pacifist gimmick, a brief partnership and feud with Rusev that sputtered out once Rusev got hurt, and an embarrassing loss in the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal at WrestleMania 33, getting eliminated by the winner Mojo Rawley after an assist from everyone's favorite dancing fool, Rob Gronkowski. Then came a shocking turn of events as Mahal received a big time push out of nowhere, winning a six pack challenge on SmackDown to earn a shot at the WWE Championship at Backlash. Now, on the surface, it seemed like an obvious ploy to pop a rating in the India market, but come on, the company wouldn't be so bold as to put the championship on a guy with such a poor win loss record, would they? Jinder Mahal is the new WWE Champion! Well, shut my mouth.
If you told me in 2013 that Jinder was going to be the first one from three-man band to hold the most important title in WWE, I never would have believed you. Even though the novelty of Mahal's champion wore off fast, he held it for an impressive seven months before dropping it to AJ Styles in the UK. As soon as Jinder rose, he would free fall back into the lower mid-card. After a blink and you miss it run with the US title, Jinder was hindered for months, finally being taken off TV last year with an injury. As of this recording, the modern-day Maharaja has yet to return to programming. Finally, we come to Drew McIntyre, who you could argue had the more glamorous run in between stints compared to Mahal. In his first match back on the Indies, Drew Galloway won the Evolve Championship. From there, he helped elevate the wrestling scene in his home country of Scotland and ICW, performed for AAA and WCPW, even became the Impact World Champion. It took long enough, but Drew was finally being positioned as the star that Vincent Mann appeared to see in him all those years ago. Also, never had to work for the Tiger King, so yeah, he did okay. After honing his skills and seemingly growing a foot and a half, Galloway became McIntyre once again, signed to NXT during WrestleMania weekend in Orlando. Drew would go unbeaten in NXT before winning their championship at TakeOver Brooklyn 3, holding it for three months before dropping it to Andrade Cien Almas, tearing his bicep in the process and being out of action for five months. McIntyre finally returned to the main roster in April of 2018, though not in the capacity many expected. Instead of going solo, Drew was given the role of Dolph Ziggler's Muscle, a partnership not unlike that of Shawn Michaels and Diesel. After briefly holding the Raw tag titles and feuding with the Shield, the two went their separate ways, though it appeared that Drew just couldn't break out on his own, inexplicably teaming with Bobby Lashley as part of Constable Corbin's mid-card vortex for several months before losing to the Shield again. After a brief alliance with Best in the World Shane McMahon, Drew had a shocking first round loss in the King of the Ring tournament. He would also lose at Crown Jewel and a Survivor Series, but things would soon turn around for the sexy Scotsman. His personality seemingly reawakened, Drew went on a tear, capped off with an epic performance in a 2020 Royal Rumble match, leading to his WrestleMania battle with Brock Lesnar for the championship. The massive impact of the show's presentation at the hands of COVID-19 notwithstanding, Drew finally fulfilled the prophecy during the two-night event and won the WWE Championship. And that was the prologue, the log, and the epilogue to the three-man band, baby. 3MB may never have been the face of WWE's tag team division, but they deserve way more credit than they're often given. It was a chance to sink or swim, and the guys all ran with it to the best of their ability, cranking up the silliness and being given TV time as a result. I'm kind of the class clown. I have the reputation of being the fun one. Guys like Drew and Jinder were given the chance to show off some character for a change, and the whole thing seemed like a lot of fun for the group. They may have lost a lot, but they were still entertaining, which is far more important in the grand scheme of things. Also, calling yourself a band and playing zero instruments, that's big dick energy there. I think maybe they've seen something bigger in me and Drew and that was their way of getting it out of us, you know. As of right now, two thirds of the group have won the WWE title, officially making it one of the most successful trios the company's made in the last 10 years. Heath's recent release is lousy news, but hopefully once things recover, he could get his job back to feed his many kids. And maybe with some more gym time, a bit of luck, and a larger beard, he can get that main event push and be on the same page as his 3MB counterparts. Did somebody say page? Oh my dick! Well, this was inevitable. <laughs>